The Haitian Revolution was a successful insurrection by self-liberated slaves against French colonial rule in Saint Domingo, now the sovereign state of Haiti. The revolt began on the 22nd of August 1791 and ended in 1804 with the former colony's independence. It involved black, biracial, French, Spanish, British, and Polish participants, with the ex-slave Toussaint Louverture emerging as Haiti's most charismatic hero. The revolution was the only slave uprising that led to the founding of a state which was both free from slavery, though not from forced labor, and ruled by non-whites and former captives. It is now widely seen as a defining moment in the history of the Atlantic world. The revolution's effects on the institution of slavery were felt throughout the Americas. The end of French rule and the abolition of slavery in the former colony was followed by a successful defense of the freedoms the former slaves won and, with the collaboration of already free people of color, their independence from white Europeans. The revolution represented the largest slave uprising since Spartacus' unsuccessful revolt against the Roman Republic nearly 1,900 years earlier, and challenged long-held European beliefs about alleged black inferiority and about slaves' ability to achieve and maintain their own freedom. The rebels' organizational capacity and tenacity under pressure inspired stories that shocked and frightened slave owners in the hemisphere. Background Much of Caribbean economic development in the 18th century was contingent on Europeans' demand for sugar. Plantation owners produced sugar as a commodity crop from cultivation of sugarcane, which required extensive labor. The colony of Saint Domingo also had extensive coffee, cocoa, and indigo plantations, but these were smaller and less profitable than the sugar plantations. The commodity crops were traded for European goods. Starting in the 1730s, French engineers constructed complex irrigation systems to increase sugarcane production. By the 1740s Saint Domingo, together with the British colony of Jamaica, had become the main supplier of the world's sugar. Production of sugar depended on extensive manual labor provided by enslaved Africans. An average of 600 ships engaged every year in shipping products from Saint Domingo to Bordeaux, and the value of the colony's crops and goods was almost equal in value to all of the products shipped from the 13 colonies to Great Britain. The livelihood of 1 million of the approximately 25 million people who lived in France in 1789 depended directly upon the agricultural imports from Saint Domingo, and several million indirectly depended upon trade from the colony to maintain their standard of living. Saint Domingo was the most profitable French colony in the world, indeed, one of the most profitable of all the European colonies in the 18th century. Slavery sustained sugar production under harsh conditions, including the unhealthy climate of the Caribbean, where diseases such as malaria, brought from Africa, and yellow fever caused high mortality. In 1787 alone, the French imported about 20,000 slaves from Africa into Saint Domingo, while the British imported about 38,000 slaves total to all of the Caribbean colonies. The death rate from yellow fever was such that at least 50% of the slaves from Africa died within a year of arriving, so while the white planters preferred to work their slaves as hard as possible, providing them only the bare minimum of food and shelter, they calculated that it was better to get the most work out of their slaves with the lowest expense possible, since they were probably going to die of yellow fever anyway. The death rate was so high that polyandry, one woman being married to several men at the same time, developed as a common form of marriage among the slaves. As slaves had no legal rights, rape by planters, their unmarried sons, or overseers was a common occurrence on the plantations. Historians continue to debate the importance of the Haitian Revolution. David Gegis asks, how much of a difference did it make? A limited amount, he concludes, for slavery flourished in the Western Hemisphere for many more decades. In the opposing camp, African-American historian W.E.B. Du Bois said that the Haitian Revolution was an economic pressure without which the British Parliament would not have accepted abolitionism as readily. Other historians say the Haitian Revolution influenced slave rebellions in the U.S. as well as in British colonies. The biggest slave revolt in U.S. history was the 1811 German Coast Uprising in Louisiana. This slave rebellion was put down and the punishment the slaves received was so severe that no contemporary news reports about it exist. The neighboring revolution brought the slavery question to the forefront of U.S. politics, and though inspiring to the enslaved themselves the resulting intensification of racial divides and sectional politics ended the idealism of the revolutionary period. The American president Thomas Jefferson, who was a slaveholder himself, refused to establish diplomatic relations with Haiti. The United States did not recognize Haiti until 1862, and imposed an economic embargo on trade with Haiti that also lasted until 1862 in an attempt to ensure the economic failure of the new republic as Jefferson wanted Haiti to fail.
regarding a successful slave revolt in the West Indies as a dangerous example for American slaves. The revolution in Haiti did not wait on the revolution in France. The call for modification of society was influenced by the revolution in France, but once the hope for change found a place in the hearts of the Haitian people, there was no stopping the radical reformation that was occurring. The Enlightenment ideals and the initiation of the French Revolution were enough to inspire the Haitian Revolution, which evolved into the most successful and comprehensive slave rebellion in history. Just as the French were successful in transforming their society, so were the Haitians. On the 4th of April 1792, the French National Assembly granted freedom to slaves in Saint Domingo. The revolution culminated in 1804. Haiti was an independent state solely of freed peoples. The activities of the revolution sparked change across the world. France's transformation was most influential in Europe, and Haiti's influence spanned every location that continued to practice slavery. John E. Bauer honors Haiti as home of the most influential revolution in history. An independent government was created in Haiti, but the country's society remained deeply affected by patterns established under French colonial rule. As in other French colonial societies, a class of free people of color had developed after centuries of French rule here. Many planters or young unmarried men had relations with African or Afro-Caribbean women, sometimes providing for their freedom and that of their children, as well as providing for education of the mixed-race children, especially the boys. Some were sent to France for education and training, and some joined the French military. The mulattoes who returned to saint Domingo became the elite of the people of color. As an educated class used to the French political system, they became the elite of Haitian society after the war's end. Many of them had used their social capital to acquire wealth, and some already owned land. Some had identified more with the French colonists than the slaves. Many of the free people of color, by contrast, were raised in French culture, had certain rights within colonial society, and generally spoke French and practiced Catholicism, with syncretic absorption of African religions. Following Dessalines' assassination, another of Toussaint's black generals, Henry Christophe, succeeded his in control of the north, while Alexandre Pechon presided over mulatto rule in the south. There were large differences in governance between Pechon's republic and what would eventually become Christophe's kingdom. While the southern republic did not have as much focus on economic development and put more attention on liberal land distribution and education, the northern kingdom went on to become relatively wealthy, though wealth distribution was disputed. As a result of temporary trade agreements between Christophe, the United States, and British colonies, Christophe was able to rebuild the northern region. There were large investments in education and public works, military infrastructure, and many chateaux, the most notable being the Sans Souci Palace in Malotte. However, much like his predecessors, this was achieved through forced labor which ultimately led to his downfall. Contrarily, Pechon was beloved by his people, but despised by his northern counterpart. A major effort by Christophe to take Port-au-Prince in mid-1812 failed. The mulattoes were harassed by a pocket of black rebellion in their rear from February 1807 to May 1819. A black leader named Goman kept alive the angry spirit of Dessalines in the southern mountains of the Grand Anse, resisting several mulatto punitive expeditions. Finally, in 1819, the new mulatto leader, Jean-Pierre Boyer, sent six regiments into the Grand Anse to ferret out Goman. The black rebel was trapped and shot off a 1,000-foot high cliff. In 1820, the island nation was finally reunified when Christophe, ill and surrounded by new rebellions, killed himself. Boyer with 20,000 troops marched into Cap Haitian, the northern capital, shortly afterward to establish his power over all of Haiti. Not too long after, Boyer was able to secure cooperation with the general of the neighboring Spanish Haiti and in February 1822 began a 22-year-long unification with the eastern state. Independence debt. The nascent state's future was hobbled in 1825 when France under Charles X forced it, with French warships anchored off the coast during the negotiations, to pay 150 million gold francs in reparations to French ex-slaveholders, as a condition of French political recognition and to end the newly formed state's political and economic isolation. By an order of the 17th of April 1825, the King of France renounced his rights of sovereignty over Santo Domingo and recognized the independence of Haiti. President Jean-Pierre Boyer believed that the constant threat of a French invasion was stymieing the Haitian economy and thus felt the need to settle the matter once and for all. Though the amount of the reparations was reduced to 90 million francs in 1838, Haiti was unable to finish paying off its debt until 1947. 
The indemnity bankrupted the Haitian treasury and left the country's government deeply impoverished, causing long-term instability. Haiti was therefore forced to take out a loan from French banks, who provided the funds for the large first instalment, severely affecting Haiti's ability to prosper. So in true essence Haiti is still a French colony.